Hello everyone, good to meet you again in Nyambung, a podcast program to get you clicked and connect with me, Dina Praptara Harja, and my co-host, Nadila Amani. Yes, uh, okay. okay. Go on, uh, Ibu. Okay, thank you, Ibu. <clears throat> so, the more and more you tell me stories about Cuba, uh, I th- I'm so enticed to learn more about the country. Uh, One of the things uh, I can conclude so far is that even though Cuba is isolated, uh, punished for uh, whatever it is uh, that the country is adopting, uh, Cuba remains resilient. So I would like to perhaps uh, hear your thoughts, uh, get your description about how the, at the, you know, uh, political levels, uh, this Cuba is running its uh, governance. Uh, all I know is that it's centralized political system. It just have a new leader, uh, the former vice president Miguel Diaz Canel. But uh, how is he as a you know uh, as a leader? How is he uh, being perceived by the people? Is he just as charismatic as the previous uh, leaders? Uh, just your your own take on it. Uh, well, as you know, that uh, Cuba uh, is a communist and socialist country. Uh, the state uh, control everything, and also the business, the economy is also controlled by the government. And since the revolution, revolution era in 1959, uh, everybody knows that Fidel Castro is the head of the was the head of the state, and also was number one person in a communist party. And uh, and followed by uh, Raúl Castro, uh, and uh, Raúl Castro decided to step down in April 2021, and uh, the successor of uh, Raúl Castro is uh, President Diaz Canal, as you mentioned. We only have one po- political party here in Cuba, Cuban Communist Party. But I heard when I talked to the CP, CP is a, a kind of leapy. DP uh, in Indonesia, the research uh, center of Cuba. Well, actually, there is a debate also inside the, polit- the, 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 the Communist Party how to make and solve the problem of uh, Cuba itself. But uh, uh, Diaz Canel is, uh, uh, is uh, very young. He is a young generation. Uh, I think uh, he is around 50s, uh, 60. There is a hope actually that there is a chain of uh, of, uh, of a policy in Cuba, especially in economy, and the government of Cuba already tried to change the monetary system. As you may know that on the 1st of January 2021, Cuba used to have three currencies uh, uh, used by the people. The first one, they call it a CUP. This is a Cuban unitary peso. Uh, they use peso uh, for uh, exchange. Uh, trading with the local people. And the second one is the UCUC. UCUC is Cuban Unitary Convertible. This is only for the tourist people. When they come here, they cannot use the local people a currency, but they, they have to convert to CUC. And there is another one is what they, uh, we, we can use dollars, US dollars. So there are three currencies that was used before January 2021. But then uh, there is a confusion uh, for the people with using these uh, three kinds of currencies. And since uh, January 1st, 2021, the government decided to have only two. Two, which is the CUP, the pesos, uh, and then the second one is US dollars. US dollars, uh, we use that uh, when we want to buy in the supermarket, for example, then uh, we buy uh, things using U.S. dollars. And then when we go to the uh, local market, we buy uh, from the people like vegetables, all those things. Then we use the pesos. We change U.S. dollar to uh, pesos. But now, June uh, 20, the uh, uh, government of Cuba, especially from uh, the uh, bank, the central bank of Cuba decided to uh, uh, to have uh, to impose the regulation of no US dollar deposit. Why? 
because uh, the government uh, had difficulties to to save their money in using US dollars in international bank because of the embargo because of the embargo so uh, uh, and also the second reason is because there is a lot of black market here the government uh, 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 one US dollar exchange to pesos is 24 but in the in the market in the society one US dollar equals to 60 pesos so government lost a lot of money yeah, a lot of inflation and government cannot control the uh, uh, money in the market in the in the public a lot of black market we just exchange to the people because the people need US dollar but they don't get a good way uh, uh, it's difficult to get the US dollar in the bank so it's just exchange from people to people so now the government decided no deposit of US dollar it seems like there will be a tendency of using euro in the future even though the government has not decided very firmly but when i went to the airport for example they don't accept us dollar anymore they accept uh, euro for buying things but we still can buy things in the supermarket using us dollar but us dollar uh, not in cash but using the card maybe just to finish uh, and, and, and there is a transition of using from US dollar to euro we don't know yet we are still waiting for the policies of the government regarding the currency but uh, of course uh, we have uh, we face uh, challenges for our own budget in the embassy because uh, we receive the money from uh, our budget from APBN is in uh, rupiah from Kemlu is for uh, rupiah, rupiah, and we change to US dollar. We get used to pay everything with US dollar, but now, uh, of of course, we have to adjust. But of course, uh, it will lose uh, the the value because of the conversion and also because of the transaction fee that will be implied to uh, our uh, embassy budget. So that's uh, that's what what's going on, uh, Dina. Yeah. Okay, back to the uh, back to the economic uh, situation, Ibu, in uh, Cuba. Uh, what you explained uh, just now uh, gives a very nice description of how uh, Cuba is trying hard to be resilient amid all the pressures from the U.S. Uh, but from the eyes of the Cuban, because they not start thinking seriously um, to use other currency in their economy and they also continue innovating, uh, creating vaccines of their own instead of importing. Um, do they actually believe that the U.S. will continue to uh, maintain its um, embargo and its policy of isolating Cuba in the, in the near future? At least, uh, I don't know, maybe five years under Biden? Does the Cuban believe that it's it will stick with the policy, U.S. Uh, foreign policy of embargo in Cuba, Ibu? Well, uh, thank you, Burina, for the question. That's a hard question. Actually, U.S. embargo against Cuba has been very, very long time, even before Fidel Castro. The first uh, impose of trade embargo for arms is, is in 1958. It, it was uh, on the sale of arms uh, that was during Batista regime. Batista, Batista regime was uh, before Fidel, Fidel Castro, but then in 1959, with the revolution uh, 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 spirit of Fidel Castro, he took over the, uh, the, the regime uh, starting in 1959. So, but the first imposed trade embargo, especially arms embargo at the time is uh, in 1959. And then it was continued during uh, uh, Fidel Castro uh, in 1960, U.S. placed an embargo on export to Cuba except for food and medicine after Cuba nationalized American-owned Cuban oil refineries without compensation. So there used to be a lot of uh, American companies in Cuba during Batista administration or before that. Yeah, 
they have a, a good relationship between uh, Cuba and uh, the United States. So there is a, a time in the history that uh, Cuba, after the Spanish colonialization, was part of the United States as a protectorate country. It was uh, the same thing like in Puerto Rico on a U.S. Virgin Island, those islands that were under that were un that, that, that are under U United States until now. So there was a good uh, relationship at that time, and there are a lot of uh, uh, American companies uh, in Cuba. But then after uh, Fidel Castro took over the the, the, uh, the administration, that American companies were being nationalized, were being nationalized without any compensation from Cuba. That was the start of the embargo, uh, uh, especially on, on the trade, because Cuba doesn't didn't give the compensation to to America, especially the American-owned Cuban oil refineries. Uh, according to my reading, Ibu, there are there were three uh, American uh, oil refineries before, but now it was owned by uh, it, it is owned by uh, Cuban oil refineries. So. That was the starting of the, the, the embargo, and uh, it, it was in 1960. And uh, in 62, uh, that was actually during the Asian Hower administration at that time. So uh, the, the landscape of the world was uh, uh, the Cold War, the, the, the rivalry of uh, influence between uh, communists and the capitalists, and of course that also influenced the foreign policy of United States uh, to Cuba. So until now, the embargo is a kind of a just a, just a, 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 just a, just a common thing for the Cuban people. They don't, there is a hope actually, if you follow the UN resolution, that is the expression of the countries to show the solidarity to Cuba. And lastly, the UN resolution, it was the resolution that was like, uh, has been uh, 29 times since 1960, uh, uh, I forgot the, the year, but that was already 29 resolution. Uh, 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 produced uh, by United States, but it didn't. It didn't change anything. It doesn't change anything. And uh, uh, there is only first time that United States in the position of abstain was during Obama administration. And Obama is trying to uh, normalize the situation. He came to visit and met with uh, Raul Castro at that time, and then trying to uh, uh, ease the sanction. At least uh, the uh, tourists from United States is open, and also the uh, transaction, the trade is open. Uh, uh, so that is uh, helping the uh, Cuban people to revive their economy. But after Trump administration, at least there are more than 20, 220 measures that uh, Trump imposed to Cuba. Why is it like that, Ibu? It's very interesting, actually. The Cuban politics, uh, the Cuban or the US politics against uh, Cuba uh, embargo is really played by the, the political elite in the United States. You know, during, the, during 1959, uh, was starting the, the communist uh, ideology at that time. Why it was like that? Actually, at the beginning, um, uh, Fidel Castro wanted to ask the uh, U.S. for the help, for the arms, but U.S. didn't, uh, didn't give. So Fidel Castro went to Russia to ask for help, and Russia helped uh, Cuba. That is the beginning why uh, Castro closed to Russia. And then until 1990, before the collapse of USSR, Cuba was helped by uh, Russia a lot. They depended a lot from the uh, uh, Russia for the financial aid and also for the export and, and, and everything. So that is the dependency between uh, Cuba and, and, and Russia. But after 1990, when the Russia USSR collapsed, uh, uh, Russia couldn't help uh, uh, Cuba anymore. So going back to the political, the U.S. Uh, politics uh, towards Cuba, you know, during the 1959, a lot of Cuban exile going to United States, and mostly they live in in Florida. They live in Florida, 
Until now, there are 2 million of Cuban people in the United States. At the beginning of the years of the revolution, the uh, U.S. gave a very relaxed immigration policy. So Cuban welcome to go to the United States when they stay in the U.S., the U.S. will give permanent residence. When at least one year staying in the U.S., then the, the, the U.S. will give the permanent residence to a Cuban people. And mostly they are in Florida. You know, Iburina, Florida is a swing state. It's a swing state. It is a battleground in 2020. Trump really, really need the support of the Florida uh, voters to support with him, to support him. Really? And a lot of Cuban, more than one million of Cuban, more than a million of Cuban live in Florida, in Miami. So, so Trump will be in the side of the Cuban American who are against the Cuban government at the moment. Because mostly they are the exile Cuban American who don't agree with the communist ideology. Yeah. Who don't agree with the communist ideology, so they supported Trump uh, a lot and Trump won in uh, in Florida. You remember 2020, uh, uh, the, the election of US? Uh, Trump won in, in Florida, the voters, mostly the Latinos and also the, the, the Cuban people supported Trump. So there is a trade off, of course, because no other exile of Cuban uh, American, then uh, the measures of embargo even uh, impose harder to the Cuban people. But then with the change of Biden administration, actually there is a big hope. There's a big hope before by the Cuban people because the experience of Obama at that time, yeah, to have a normalization of relationship between America and, and, and Cuba, then there is a big hope from, uh, from Cuba and also from some of the Cuban who are in America to normalize and to ease, to ease the relationship, at least to leave the, uh, the embargo of uh, trading, the embargo of uh, remittance because uh, a lot of Cuban Americans send their remittance to a uh, Cuban family here. During Trump administration, it is limited only 300 US dollar every month. But before that, more than 1,000, more than 1,000 US dollar. That, that helps the remittance helps the Cuban family and the Cuban economy here. Besides the tourists from United States. So, so actually, the politics of U.S. in Cuba is also played by the Cuban American, and mostly in 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 in, in Florida. Besides, you know, uh, I have to watch now there uh, why uh, Biden still has no no movement to ease the normalization. Uh, when you heard uh, from uh, press secretary uh, Jean uh, something like that, I forgot the name. She said that Cuban uh, foreign policy of U.S. toward Cuban is not a priority yet. It's not a priority yet because uh, U.S. is still focused on their domestic things. Besides, also, you know, the relationship with Russia, with with, with China, and then withdrawal of the soldiers from Afghanistan. So those things. But uh, you, you know, a lot of Cuban also Cuban American, I, I, I would say, they are also in a political party of Republican and, and Democrat. And those are the one who are uh, the exile from the Cuba. And those are the one who are against the normalization of uh, relationship between US and Cuba. The, 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 the target is actually to make the regime change in Cuba regime change, uh, so people, uh, you know, starting to uh, shout out, but they've been living for 60 years like that. So people get used with the shortages of food, shortages of everything, difficulties of life. They are very tough people. They're very resilient with all those, uh, those uh, experience. So uh, that's what happened actually. Um, this is really uh, uh, very interesting to look at the U.S. Uh, foreign policy towards Cuba and the influence of uh, the Cuban Americans. Uh, and, and it's not easy. If you look at the head of the uh, 
Bob Mendenes is the head of the Foreign uh, Relation Committee in the Senate. He is also Cuban and then also some Cubans in Republican uh, and also in Democratic uh, parties uh, that are still uh, uh, opposing so the polit uh, the political elites in United States have no yet uh, thing to start the relationship within U.S. and Cuba uh, 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 get better. But there are other other group also. Ibu think tanks have a different opinion. They they, they see that Cuban people are very uh, suffering. And also the business people like in Kansas City, for example, they want to export their agricultural products to uh, Cuba. Uh, 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 but those uh, two, two groups, uh, uh, they need a lot of support in the, in the Senate and also in the, in the Congress to uplift the uh, embargo. So it's not easy, it's very hard, except if the leader itself like Obama last time, uh, thought in a different way. So uh, perhaps you can enlighten us just a bit about how the de the regular people who just, you know, maybe low middle income in the country survive. What is their source of income mostly? Uh, well, they rely on agriculture, of course, Ibu. And, uh, they get used with the embargo for 60 years. It means uh, it is one generation, if you can imagine. If you were born in 1960, they never experienced how good life is. They get used with uh, the shortages. So they don't know the difference between having uh, abundance of uh, food and having a shortage of food. So queuing up in a supermarket, queuing up in the in the traditional market is just a, just a common just a common common uh, uh, view, normal. normal, normal in the, in their life. They are very patient and they are very tough to uh, to to see that. Some people, of course, most of the people they are government employee, and in Cuba, every month during the Castro administration, every month the people get the extra food like a ban sauce. Bantuan social, social security food, social security food from the government. Like they get uh, uh, milk, they get uh, eggs, they get rice, they get beans, they get also uh, uh, oil, cooking oil, but very limited. So um, they can also buy. And I think the government uh, employees, uh, they get paid around 100 or 150 to 200 US, US dollars. It depends on your, your, your level, of course. And uh, they are very educated, Ibu, uh, because, uh, because uh, the government uh, give uh, free for uh, education. So the Human Development Index of Cuba is uh, in the rank of uh, uh, 70 out of 189 countries in the world, rank 70, so 0 0.78. This is the HDI, the Human Development Index uh, in, nine, in 2020. In 2020, Indonesia rank is in 107. Cuban rank is in 70. The poor here, the GDP is less than Indonesia, but their HDI, Human Development Index, there are a lot of factors, of course, from, from for HDI, including the education, is in the rank of 70 out of 189. China is in um, uh, less than even uh, Cuba. The rank is 0 0.761. Cuba is 0 0.783, so it's higher in in terms of HDI, Human Development Index. I told you already the life expectancy, the HDI, the Cuban doctors. And interestingly, Budina, women in parliament, women in parliament in Cuba is on the second highest in the world. 53% of women are members of parliament. And in the constitution, the new constitution in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, the constitution mentioned that the uh, the state, the government, uh, 
uh, uh, protect the rights of the, the women to join in any kinds of uh, uh, activities yeah? in politics, in economics, in education, in, in any kinds of uh, uh, development. So 53% uh, of uh, members of parliament are women. So very interesting to see how uh, high the numbers of the women and uh, we will, in Indonesia, I think we already have a special measures like 30% of the candidates of the, uh, uh, what is that, the pangajuan, yeah, uh, for uh, being um, members of parliament should be a women, but still we cannot reach the target of 30% of member of parliament uh, in the last uh, election. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yes, uh, Cuba has uh, features that Indonesians must be aware of. Far away from us, only about 11.3 million in population. But the fact that uh, the government is trying everything it can to remain uh, resilient with their ideology, with their way of living, <laughs> despite all the pressures, is deserve monitoring yeah, from us, yeah, despite uh, deserve watching from us uh, it's it's uh, fascinating to see so Ibu, if um, we can offer like the final thoughts about uh, cuba in international relations um, you coming from asia and perhaps you also have conversations with other women ambassadors there seeing uh, cuba uh, from from a different lens now that you are based in havana what would you offer uh, as a final points about Cuba, Ibu? Uh, well, uh, from Indonesian side, uh, we offer so many uh, capacity building, Ibu. Uh, capacity building to help Cuba, especially in agriculture sectors. Uh, we offer some trainings through virtual at the moment uh, to help the agriculture uh, reform in Cuba, especially training for uh, the uh, artificial uh, insemination, insemination, and then also with uh, data digitalization of uh, agriculture. So there are uh, we focusing to help the uh, agriculture uh, of Cuba. So it will be uh, helping their uh, food uh, sovereignty, sovereignty. Because in Cuba they call for, uh, food sovereignty, not like in Indonesia we call food security. So whatever from which country we get the food, as far as people eat, then uh, that's a matter. In Cuba, they call it a food sovereignty. They want to be kedaulatan uh, untuk food. The second thing we also uh, offer them for a capacity building uh, in uh, training for their uh, senior diplomats, uh, senior diplomats through SES Parlu Ibu. So uh, through SES Parlu, we are also offering uh, the training for that. And uh, also, uh, we also give uh, some scholarship, uh, offer some scholarship for the uh, Cuban students, especially in Islamic studies, uh, because there's one, uh, when I go to the provinces, there's always a mushola and also the, 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 the uh, mosque. So we offer also, uh, I talked to uh, the uh, professor Komarudin Hidayat, they offer some scholarship for those Cuban, the Muslim Cuban who want to uh, study uh, Islam in Indonesia. We also offer them for the uh, undergraduate, uh, master degree and also PhD degree for those uh, Cuban people who want to uh, study in Indonesia under the Ministry of uh, Education. That is what we offer. Uh, in the future, of course, uh, we want to uh, work together with uh, uh, with uh, Indonesia, especially with the uh, medical doctors from uh, Cuba, uh, uh, exchange the best practices, the vaccine from Cuba to Indonesia. So, in, in exchange of best practices and expert expertise between Indonesia and and, and Cuba, and uh, also, of course, uh, uh, Cuba in international uh, relations. Uh, they are very active in uh, United Nations group to get the support uh, to uh, leave, uh, to release the uh, embargo. And at the moment, uh, they are also uh, in 2020, uh, Cuba already acceded the TAC, uh, Treaty of Amity and uh, Cooperation of ASEAN. Uh, so they uh, become the uh, 
the ASEAN uh, TAC uh, observers also. And also uh, they uh, are members of uh, Cuba in IOM. Uh, Baru mau ya? Sudah, duduk, sudah duduk. Okay, and also Cuba uh, sit as a member of IOM, International uh, Organization of Migration, ECOSOC, Ibu. Uh, they are also uh, a member of ECOSOC. They are also a member of uh, WTO uh, since 1995. They are also a member of IMF and also observer of CARICOM. So they are very active in international uh, relation, in international organization. And their diplomats are also tough, small, but very tough. Maybe because the life is also tough in Cuba. That's what I experienced also. Sometimes me and my staff here in the embassy, we couldn't find rice, <laughs> we couldn't find the cooking oil. So though our diplomats, Indonesian diplomats who are posted in Cuba, I believe they will be a tough diplomats too. So oh. when uh, they are, you know, they finish, uh, I, I believe wherever they will be posted, then they will be a strong and a tough diplomats like us. Uh, <laughs> there, there's a term for that, Ibu, right? Kawah Chandra di Muka. How do we translate that into Bahasa? <laughs> so it's like like the uh, eternal testing. Yeah? If you pass that, you become sakti and very magically strong. Eh? Thank you so much for your support once again. Our podcast is available at YouTube and Spotify at Nyambung with Dina Proptora Harja. Uh, make sure to send us uh, your questions or your thoughts uh, through YouTube comment section. And if you enjoy the episode, don't forget to like, share the link to your community and subscribe so you make sure you don't miss our contents because we post every week.